And I'll give you an example. A very, very senior journalist in this country said to me the other day, he's trying to put together a piece on the utter dishonesty we're getting from our leadership at the moment about climate change. Mm. The dishonesty he's talking about is not to argue with the science. It's something else I've been saying for a long time, because this issue of trust. We've got a huge debate going on in Australia at the moment about the cost of living, and governments are pretending they can solve it with all the solutions that are going to make it worse, by the way. But here's the great lie. Of course, if you're worried about emissions, you're saying human beings are overdoing it, and we need to reduce your living standards. And so you're saying to young people who are worried about climate change, um, we'll get you a, a secure future without being honest and saying, actually, we've got to look, lower your living standards. There is no other way around this. This talk about it, you know, a, a new economy built on renewables being prosperity for everybody, nobody really believes that. There's no leadership. Leadership would demand that you actually level with people and say, we've got to make these massive changes, if that's what you believe, and they will result in lower living standards. It is not true that renewables are cheaper in this country, for example, than coal. They're not, and they never will be. And no one even points out, for example, these massive solar farms we're building. You've got to go and replace them all within 20 years. Replace them all. So there's this incredible walking of both sides of the street. I guess my question to you is, do you think people sort of instinctively understand that they're being misled? Uh, some people do, and some people don't. And if you remember my speech at the Oxford Union, which did crazy numbers online, in which this is the, the great tragedy of my career. I keep getting recognition and, and opportunities because I'm saying really obvious things that everybody knows. I'm just one of the few people prepared to say them. All I said in that speech, all I said in terms of the climate issue was poor people do not want to stay poor. That means they're going to keep growing their economies. And that means that the way to solve climate change is going to be through technology and getting better at resource efficiency, etc. You are not going to get people to reduce their living standards. You are just not. And and everybody, broadly speaking, knows it when they hear it. But you don't hear it said because it's unsayable in the public space. When I when I watched that, I immediately thought uh, Indonesia, fourth most populous nation on earth, rising out of poverty in many ways. In many ways, an admirable people doing amazing things. You know, mm. great challenges. But my understanding is there's somewhere between 100 and 150 million people in that country still spending 90% of their income on food. So given that cheap energy is critical to the cost of food, the slightest interruption and suddenly you're pushing people back into a situation where they can't feed their kids. They don't care about the environment when that happens. They care about feeding their kids. I had um, lunch with uh, the Indian ambassador to the UK a few, a few months ago, actually after I gave that speech. And I asked him, what do you think about what I've said? And he said, and he said when, during, when India became independent in 1947, life expectancy, like average life expectancy, I think was 32. 1947, John, within the lifetime of many people who are alive today. Today, it's over 70. How, how did that happen? It happened because... T- they're burning fossil fuels and they're using energy to make the lives of their people better, to make sure that the infants survive longer and they've massively cut infant mortality. You think they want to go back to 1947? Don't, don't be silly. This is nonsense. So the idea that we're going to prevent billions of people, which is who is causing most of this uh, emissions now, to to reduce their standards of living, to watch their children die in agony from preventable disease or lack of medical care or whatever. It's not going to happen. So we should stop pretending. But again, this is a question of leadership. And I just, I think we've got ourselves locked into a vicious cycle. The media wants to present politicians as liars. Therefore, you get politicians who are liars. We then have contempt for them. No one then wants to go into politics who's honest. And it just goes round and round and round. And somebody is going to have to come along and break that cycle. Well, so do the better. It really is. And they're going to have to be people who clearly understand that the Western experiment has produced the best results for people even if you talk about that doubling of lifespan in the developing world, because it's essentially happened under the stewardship of the West and the Americans leading it, 
whether we like it or not, a sta- reasonably stable global order since the end of the Second World War, especially given that the Cold War didn't develop into a hot one. It's been about scientific research. And not many Australians know this, but the role we played in the Green Revolution, doubling those lifespans in the impoverished part of the world, it's the one area where Australia is punched way above its weight. Huh. Even today, we're amongst the seven biggest investors in agricultural research for the benefit of the less well-off huh. six countries and the Gates Foundation. Uh, but it's also been affordable, available energy. All of those factors, they're all at risk. And nobody's talking about the trade-offs. 